Thanks. Yes. Thank you. Uh, good morning. I, I learned that uh, I'm giving a talk right uh, like a minute ago because I thought that uh, I'm going after the uh, Bernevik stock. So uh, probably be somewhat disorganized. Uh, so yeah, I'll be talking about um, uh, the uh, topology of the wave functions uh, at the Fermi surface of a metal, and uh, uh, it's a, a sequence of several works done with uh, 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 Iris Alexander Dinata, uh, who uh, is a uh, postdoctoral fellow at, at Yale, and before that he was at, uh, at Princeton, uh, actually with uh, Andre. Um, and uh, just to uh, if he's him, uh, just to set the stage, I'll explain uh, maybe what is the uh, what is it about. Uh, so, so first, I'll just remind uh, people about the conventional terminology, which is science about uh, uh, electronic states uh, in metals, uh, and. Um, I'll remind how usually uh, the Fermi surface in metals uh, is measured uh, by means of uh, uh, measurement of uh, magnetic oscillations. Uh, that will bring us to uh, the also seemingly well-known idea of uh, the uh, semiclassical quantization of, uh, of block electrons. Uh, but uh, it turns out that uh, if one takes into account the peculiarities of the uh, of the band structure uh, of a topological metals, there are some uh, modifications uh, to the conventional uh, Borzheimer-Feld quantization rule, and that's basically the subject uh, of our work. Uh, um, how the Borzheimer-Feld quantization rule um, uh, gives information about the topology. Uh, of the of the states or electron states at the Fermi surface. Uh, I'll tell also about some applications of the developed theory, and also in passing we will need another notion from theory of uh, metals, which comes back from, I guess, mid '60s, uh, is the notion of the uh, magnetic breakdown. Uh, so first of all. Uh, what are the uh, charged excitations? What are the electron excitations in a metal? Uh, the, in general, electrons are charged, right? So they're strongly interacting. Uh, so how to describe uh, uh, the uh, conduction electrons in a metal? Well, uh, the, the idea uh, of theoretical description um, belongs to uh, Landau, and the, the idea became known as theory of uh, um, the Landau Fermi liquid. And, and the, the, the core point is that uh, the low energy excitations uh, of uh, even interacting fermions uh, can be described basically by uh, the uh, free, uh, almost free, uh, quasi particles. So uh, the, the states can be uh, uh, labeled in a way that makes a correspondence between the excitations of the interacting system and uh, uh, those of uh, free. Fermi gas. Uh, so in other words, uh, uh, the uh, excitations form uh, liquid of uh, weakly interacting quasiparticles. Now, uh, quasiparticles are uh, fairly well defined and energies uh, close to the Fermi level. And uh, basically, the cornerstone of uh, Fermi liquid theory uh, is in a fairly simple calculation of the uh, relaxation rate. Uh, of a fermion that is elevated above the Fermi level uh, by some energy epsilon. Say we, we're speaking about clean materials, so there is uh, well conserved quantity momentum. And let's forget about lattice for, for now for this one slide. And then uh, if uh, we include interaction, this uh, uh, electron will relax to some lower energy uh, due to the collision with a, a particle uh, belonging to the Fermi C. Uh, and there is a severe uh, phase space constraint such a process because the scattering should uh, result uh, in the final state for the uh, elevated uh, fermion still above the Fermi level. So the transferred energy E is constrained by epsilon. And by the same token, the uh, electrons that interacts uh, with, uh, with R1 and gets excited must get out from the Fermi surface, uh, from under the Fermi surface. So 
uh, it, the initial state exon prime cannot be too deep inside the Fermi C. So basically, uh, these two uh, 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 conditions uh, for the transferred energy uh, are defined by uh, uh, the limits of the integration for exon prime, as I explained, it must be not too deep, and uh, by the transferred energy, which uh, has to be smaller than epsilon. Okay, and the rest of the uh, uh, integrand is just some matrix element squared for me, for the golden rule. And, but the main player here is this double integration uh, over constrained phase space, and uh, that leads uh, to the scaling of one over tau, the rate uh, proportional to energy squared. So that's basically uh, the main thing is that the, uh, the lifetime of a quasi-particle is, is long compared to one over the energy of quasi-particle, right? So one over tau scales is epsilon squared for a quasi-particle with energy epsilon. So in this respect, quasi-particles are long-lived uh, and uh, uh, therefore uh, we may speak of uh, basically uh, a guess of quasi-particles on a more uh, descriptive level or theoretical level, uh, essentially it means that the self-energy uh, of, uh, of electron near the Fermi surface has a small uh, imaginary part that scales as one over energy squared. Or yet in another language, if I look at the spectral function, which actually can be measured directly in ARPES, uh, the, uh, the widths uh, of the uh, Lorentzian peak uh, uh, at given momentum, so it's a Lorentzian peak in energy, uh, this, this width scales as energy squared measure, energy measured from the Fermi level. So it's, it's, a narrow, it's a narrow peak. So that's basically how we can get rid of uh, interactions, at least on a, a simple theory level, and go to the free particles. And then the next step is to account for the band structure. So the, for the fact that actually uh, these quasi particles live not in free space, but uh, in in some periodic potential, and uh, then uh, the, the states uh, have certain classification uh, that is given by block theorem. So uh, the wave functions can be represented as a uh, as a plane wave times uh, uh, cell periodic function, uh, which uh, depends on the particular value of the uh, quasi momentum uh, that uh, is inside uh, a, a Brillouin zone. And uh, the spectrum uh, of uh, a Hamiltonian with pretty potential uh, yields a band structure. Uh, and, and then uh, basically the difference between uh, metals and insulators in, in terms of band structure is that the difference between materials that uh, uh, where Fermi level uh, is, uh, lies in, uh, in a band uh, or uh, somehow in a gap if there are gaps uh, in the spectrum. So uh, this is an example of a metal. Uh, the Fermi level is within a band. Uh, and uh, basically then uh, the next question is that uh, what is the shape of the surface in momentum space uh, where um, we can create a low energy excitation, right? So if we apply some small frequency, um, uh, say microwave signal or, or some finer temperature, much smaller than the Fermi energy, then excitations are created uh, around the surface where uh, at zero temperature there is a boundary between field and empty states, right? Uh, so this question about the uh, shape uh, of the Fermi surface uh, was um, a highly uh, research question uh, in, um, in late 50s, early 60s. Uh, uh, and uh, the whole field uh, got name of fermiology. So basically, it's study uh, of the shape of the Fermi surface and the dynamics of excitations uh, near the Fermi surface. Uh, and uh, probably if so, if you didn't, you just Google up, uh, I don't know, measuring Fermi surface and you'll find lots of uh, pretty pictures. Uh, so some of them are um, uh, computer simulations, but some of them are really relative measurements. So uh, for example, bismuth is studied uh, in all glory details and uh, all the ellipsoids are known very well uh, from measurements and uh, people know uh, the, uh, the shapes uh, of the Fermi surface uh, uh, for bismuth uh, in detail. Uh, this is copper, uh, also studied experimentally quite well. 
I'm not sure about lead. Uh, so this is rather some calculation of um, some uh, band structure calculation. Uh, so how uh, one finds uh, the shape of the Fermi surface uh, from experiment, uh, turns out that the, uh, the main method um, uh, was, probably still is, uh, is the uh, so-called magnetic oscillation phenomena. Uh, now, uh, if, if you just, at the, at the first sight, if you apply magnetic field, uh, you, you scrub the dynamics of electrons big way because basically uh, uh, at a quantum mechanical level, what happens is that uh, you replace um, uh, momentum, not quasi-momentum, but momentum by uh, the uh, uh, um, uh, elongated form, for form, including vector potential, which is, uh, dep which is coordinate dependent. And uh, the, um, uh, the mutual effect of, uh, vector of vector potential and scalar potential, predict scalar potential, is, uh, leads to very complicated structure of uh, energy level, uh, levels. Uh, you probably, everybody saw this uh, beautiful picture of a butterfly. They're beautiful, but uh, uh, not very easy to uh, analyze. And again, it's for some specific, for some specific model, uh, the simplest model which has nothing to do uh, with real materials. Uh, however, it turns out that uh, there is a great simplification uh, for the weak magnetic field. Uh, so if uh, the, uh, uh, if the uh, Landau length, uh, uh, which depends on the strength of the field, uh, is large compared to the latest parameter, uh, then uh, one may greatly simplify the analysis of the uh, uh, dynamics of electrons uh, in uh, uh, periodic potential. And uh, that uh, uh, idea is known uh, as uh, Pyrrell's substitution. So basically, what Pyrrell suggested is the following thing. Uh, take uh, the bent uh, spectrum for a given bent A, epsilon A of H bar K, and K is the quasi-momentum, it's not momentum, it's quasi-momentum, and then do uh, a replacement of H bar K uh, by uh, the uh, kinematic momentum, by uh, uh, 1 over i dd ddr minus e over c a of r. Or it's easier actually to replace r uh, in, in form of uh, 1 over i ddp. Uh, so uh, basically this way, uh, this k becomes an operator. Uh, and uh, the uh, energy spectrum epsilon of hk uh, creates, if you wish, a Hamiltonian. Okay, so now you have a Hamiltonian uh, epsilon of p minus a uh, and um, for free particles, it will be p squared over 2m, and it's all familiar, but uh, uh, this epsilon is a periodic function of h bar k, and it becomes uh, some periodic function, non-trivial function of p minus a. And the first question one may ask is, that was a, what is the classical dynamics of electrons uh, with uh, such Hamilton function? Okay, so now I'll treat for a second uh, p and uh, r uh, as classical variables that uh, have a Poisson bracket. Uh, so it's actually uh, 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 easy and cute. So the first equation here is, is just, uh, if you want, if you wish, it's uh, Newton's law. So it's uh, uh, DDT of momentum uh, equals velocity uh, uh, cross B. Uh, so uh, this is just the classical definition of velocity, uh, which is uh, uh, the derivative of energy with respect to momentum. So uh, it is clear that um, uh, particles, uh, a, a state uh, 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 will move in momentum space just around uh, a, a the energy uh, surface uh, a, a, along some cross section, which is perpendicular to the direction of the field. So uh, the momentum along, uh, along B is conserved, uh, and um, a state that is automatic field was just a point uh, at the Fermi surface will start moving in momentum space and will make an entire loop if it's a closed surf surface, um, going around some cross-section. Now, having uh, this closed, moment, uh, closed equation for momentum solved, one can find also uh, trajectories in real space, and those are uh, uh, helicons. Uh, so basically, uh, you have, a, um, for closed sur uh, Fermi surface, you have some uh, circular motion uh, of, uh, of a projection 
of a state uh, on the plane uh, x, y, and uh, if there are some velocity along the direction, then you form a helix. Okay, so that's uh, quite simple, uh, and actually that uh, yields a, a whole host of phenomena that uh, allow to uh, investigate uh, the structure of the Fermi surface. Uh, and those uh, the examples that I'm giving here are not the leading tools to study uh, the Fermi surface, but they are kind of uh, educationally uh, uh, appealing. So, uh, so uh, because you have a periodic motion uh, of a particle uh, in, uh, in real space as well as in momentum space, uh, you may try to create a resonance by uh, uh, sending a wave uh, that has a commensurate uh, period uh, to the diameter of the orbit. And one of the ways uh, to do it is to send, send a sound wave and look at sound attenuation. And sound attenuation uh, uh, peaks uh, at resonances when uh, the diameter of the orbit of central motion uh, equals to uh, 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 n times n is integer times the uh, sound wavelengths. Okay, so that's a resonance uh, uh, just geometrical resonance, so to speak. And uh, another uh, possibility is to synchronize uh, motion in time uh, with external uh, electromagnetic field. And uh, this is uh, as close as it gets to uh, the conventional physics of cyclotron uh, accelerator. So basically, in a metal, the skin depth is very <coughs> thin. It was also understood by Pippard. Uh, back then, and, and uh, electrons that are uh, moving uh, in a field parallel to the uh, surface of a metal uh, go by surface uh, every so often, every period, uh, and if one shines um, uh, a radio frequency wave uh, which is in resonance uh, with electron motion, then basically electron will get a kick every time uh, it passes through the skin, uh, skin depth, uh, skin layer <laughs> near the surface. And that will create uh, peaks in the uh, absorption of uh, electromagnetic waves. So it will affect the surface impedance of a metal. And that's basically if one does a resonator out of this metal and studies uh, Q factor, uh, it's another way to study, yet another way to study uh, the periodicity uh, of motion of electrons. Uh, and it was understood uh, actually also quite long ago that uh, this periodicity, uh, this period is related to the derivative of the cross-sectional area of Fermi surface with respect to the energy. So uh, now one may understand that because you can take any PZ, uh, the whole, uh, uh, whole host of the cyclotron uh, periods uh, corresponding to different cross-sections, but it was understood quite early that uh, uh, what matters are the extremal cross-sections where, uh, where the area is passing through uh, the uh, largest or smallest value uh, for all uh, available uh, values of PZ. Uh, so now uh, if I look at either of these relations, I'll understand that uh, uh, the inverse field uh, at which uh, there is a peak of absorption scales as uh, integer n. So 1 over b uh, forms uh, an equidistant sequence. Um, uh, and uh, one may simply uh, uh, restore the coefficient uh, between 1 over b and n and this integer. So just look at, uh, uh, say, uh, n equals a million and n equals million plus 1. It doesn't matter whether it's million, 2 million, or 55. The difference will give me, uh, I can measure this, this, these two values uh, at two subsequent values of n, uh, and that will give me uh, basically, the information about the extremal cross sections uh, about p and d d epsilon. So that's how one gets information about the geometry of, of Fermi surface by classical means. It's, there is no quantum mechanics involved. Uh, uh, but now, uh, actually, this, uh, this uh, notion of extremal trajectories appeared, uh, as far as I understood. I tried to find where it came first, and apparently, it came actually from quantum mechanics. And uh, uh, there is a paper of Van Zager. There is apparently unpublished or never published talk of uh, I am Lifshitz, and there is a well known paper of Lifshitz Kasevich, and all is within four years. So uh, now from classical mechanics, we go to quantum mechanics, and uh, uh, the uh, condition for, uh, uh, for um, uh, 
quantized states, discrete states, come from Borzano third quantization of motion. And uh, as we discussed, so uh, the trajectory in momentum space uh, is some uh, closed orbit like this circle. And if I project it on one of the, of the axes, for example, on Kx, it will be just motion back and forth. So it's 1D motion. And for 1D motion, you, you sort of have two turning points. Uh, and uh, that uh, tells me that the, um, the condition for the uh, uh, the, Bor the Borzano condition will, uh, will contain the following, uh, uh, will have the following form, that uh, the, uh, the area uh, under the uh, uh, surface, uh, uh, the, uh, the area of the cross section uh, in, uh, uh, in units of, uh, in universal units depending on magnetic field, uh, in units depending on magnetic field, uh, equals two pi n plus pi. And this pi is just coming from turning points. Uh, and uh, you can see that it's uh, very similar to uh, the exact formula for the, one, uh, for the uh, oscillator levels, uh, uh, h bar omega times n plus one half, and it's, uh, it has exactly the same flavor. Uh, so uh, Iris told me that it's called uh, Maslow correction, uh, and uh, basically each uh, turning point, as we know, gives you one quarter, and uh, there are two Maslow corrections coming from the two turning points. Uh, now I've also learned that uh, this one half uh, in literature uh, since uh, Anzager's paper is called and Zagger phase factor. So once again, if I look uh, at the two subsequent levels, the difference uh, is uh, a frequency, h bar times frequency, and this omega c is just staggered on frequency, the same frequency that uh, was uh, uh, described on the previous slide uh, as formula, uh, the uh, Shockley formula for the period. So it's just two pi over Shockley period. And therefore, uh, this, uh, product, uh, this derivative DAD epsilon is uh, basically the effective mass, cyclotron mass, that defines uh, the, uh, the spectrum of um, energies for cyclotron motion. Okay, so that uh, is a, a, a quantization, a uh, positive quantization of, of energies. Uh, so now, uh, uh, the, the, the way to ask this question for, for a metal and for some measurement is that, uh, suppose we know where the chemical potential is of Fermi level, uh, let's ask our, ourselves how the Landau levels are emerging uh, from under the Fermi level, right? So each time uh, yet another Landau level emerges from Fermi level, there, is, there should be some peculiarity of the response. So uh, this is especially simple in 3D because in 3D uh, one may assume that chemical potential is field independent. Uh, there are lots of Landau levels, actually Landau bands because there is PZ motion. Uh, that stabilize uh, the position of Fermi level and therefore uh, passing of yet another Landau level from under the uh, Fermi level upon increased magnetic field will not, will not affect the position of the Fermi level. So I can assume that Fermi level is fixed. Uh, and then instead of writing uh, the equation for energy levels, uh, I'll write an equation for the magnetic fields at which energy equals to the Fermi energy. Okay, so that will be conditioned when uh, yet another Landau level, or better say bent because there is PZ direction, uh, uh, emerges from, the, from under the Fermi level. So, and then <coughs> what we see is that uh, the distance between uh, two subsequent values of one over B, so this difference, scales uh, as, uh, well, uh, has information about the, uh, about the, uh, uh, the cross section uh, of the uh, Fermi surface. So, uh, and here is a pictorial representation. So the energy is fixed and uh, there are these values, Bn, Bn plus one, Bn plus two, and so on. And if one plots uh, uh, the inverse of, uh, of these uh, fields as a function of n, uh, one gets a sequence of points. And in semi-classical limit, uh, basically when this A of e EF is just a constant, uh, uh, then it's a straight line. Uh, and uh, no matter how big our ends, and we actually don't know uh, uh, what are they because we cannot apply such a field that will just depopulate all the levels, say in, uh, uh, in sodium or some good metal. But what one can do is to uh, look at the sequence and then extrapolate uh, to, uh, the, um, uh, to the um, uh, infinite field, uh, one over b equals zero, and there will be some uh, uh, intercept. 
uh, on the n-axis, and that's basically the Anzager phase factor. Uh, and uh, as I discussed, so far is just trivial, it's some one half. Uh, so, uh, so now what is measured, the simplest, and actually it turns out the most important measurement uh, in this business is uh, the gas van Alphen, which is just oscillation of monetization. Uh, and uh, the calculation of uh, these oscillations uh, uh, was done for arbitrary uh, spectrum. And I emphasize for arbitrary spectrum because, okay, I'll tell you why, uh, was done by Lipset and Kasevich. Uh, and um, the position of maxima uh, in uh, monetization uh, have this additional pi over four, and it comes from some uh, trivial expansion of Bessel function uh, at large arguments. So that's not entirely physical, and uh, it's just some simple shift. Uh, and uh, uh, it turns out that even uh, in early days, uh, People did look at uh, the phase vector just to show actually that uh, the Boltzmann field picture works. Uh, now, a similar uh, uh, measurement can be done uh, uh, by uh, uh, looking at uh, oscillations of conductivity, which is Schumnik of the Haas oscillations. And uh, finally, in principle, one may do also in STM measurements uh, and just have direct access uh, to Landau levels. And that actually is good for 2D. Uh, so the, the uh, probably well known to some uh, fact, uh, and I didn't appreciate it, that actually in 2D, uh, the chemical potential oscillates quite a bit when you change magnetic field. And, and uh, you cannot learn uh, the phase, um, the Enzager phase from uh, Shubnik of the Haas, because basically uh, you measure points where the Landau level is half filled. Uh, and uh, it doesn't matter uh, what, uh, so basically you cannot measure the spectrum directly, you measure equation factors rather. Uh, but if you have an access to, to just to the spectrum, uh, basically you measure density of states, then you, then you just know the Landau levels and you, you know everything including this uh, Anzager factor. Uh, so um, I maybe spend uh, one minute on, on some historical remark. So I was at some point I was compelled to look at the entire paper and uh, understand why actually, at least in, in USSR it was called Lipschitz and Zager. So, uh, uh, so the paper contains very few equations and actually the very last one uh, in conclusions, in, summarize, in summary, is uh, the famous uh, uh, Anzager formula. Uh, this theta is basically the Anzager phase that I was mentioning here, mentioning a minute ago. Uh, and it says, first of all, that there is nothing new in this paper, uh, which is kind of humble. Uh, and it says also that uh, to do uh, quantitative theory, uh, one needs to do uh, more calculations, and that's uh, what is Lipschitz Kasevich. And when it says nothing new at the end, I try to look at the beginning, and uh, basically it refers to Schoenberg and Landau 1940, uh, where apparently uh, this was already done. Uh, and uh, well, actually, to tell you the truth, I tried to look at this paper that he refers to. And first of all, it's not Landau Schoenberg, it's just Schoenberg. And second, it, it's paper about something else. So, uh, so plot thickened. And then I found actually um, an obituary uh, to um, uh, for Schoenberg, uh, written by Chambers, another great uh, experimentalist who uh, worked on this subject. And uh, you can read it yourself. So it turns out that uh, basically uh, there was a Landau. As far as I said, it was Landau's calculation uh, for free particles uh, unpublished, uh, which did do uh, this Poisson summation and everything that was done later on uh, for arbitrary spectrum, but it was never published uh, because of uh, some political things. Uh, but uh, the, for us, what was important is that uh, uh, this, this, this phrase uh, telling basically that uh, in, uh, uh, in view of Anzager, there, uh, there is nothing new, and it will be nothing new, <laughs> uh, except open orbits. This, um, uh, ex uh, except this, the one negative principal mass is permissible and indicates a hyperboloid. Hyperboloid means that you have open surface, and uh, then uh, things are different. Uh, so this ellipsis and hyperboloids, and that's it. So that's basically uh, what we want to analyze and, and see whether there is anything left uh, since 52. Uh, so uh, I'll go back to, uh, to the condition, 
uh, and remind that uh, basically this pi came from uh, from the two turning points. And uh, uh, let's analyze what uh, what went into uh, uh, this result. So there are two things. One is that uh, this was done for a single band, uh, which is deformable to a circle. So figure eight will not work. So deformable to a circle, uh, non-degenerate. Um, and, and second thing that was important is that uh, the uh, operator of coordinate, if you remember the uh, power substitution was replacing uh, uh, quasi momentum by, by P minus A. And uh, A depends on, on coordinate. And the operator of coordinate was just uh, DDP that acts on the plane wave factor, uh, on this factor in the block function. And uh, the self predict function uh, was untouched. Uh, and the question is whether you know it brings anything new. So here is an example, it, I would say almost trivial one, that shows that actually self periodic function also matters. Uh, and that's uh, uh, beloved by many of us, uh, uh, Rasba spin orbit coupling term added to p squared over 2m. So basically, you can think of uh, two deg uh, uh, in some well, uh, which breaks uh, uh, inverse and symmetry. Uh, and um, uh, creates this way, uh, this term is a Hamiltonian, which is uh, normal of, uh, to, the, uh, to the surface times uh, S cross P, uh, P is momentum. Uh, and uh, uh, let's uh, uh, take into account that there is a self-predict function. In this case, actually, because I, I, I look seriously at spin, uh, this self-predict function is a spinner, and it's important. So it, it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's, a, it's a vector in, uh, in spin, in spin space, right? Uh, and uh, what's more important is that this spinner depends on momentum. So you can think of this, you know, little column of two numbers, but it's not just one zero. It's, uh, it's something that depends on the direction of the momentum. And here is pictorial representation. So I apply magnetic field, and as I said, uh, instead of uh, a point uh, being at rest, it starts moving in momentum space. And there is this vector attached to this point, okay, and it moves together. And by the time uh, a point makes full circle, uh, a vector makes full circle. And it's, it's a vector that corresponds to a spinner, right? So I can spin one half, and I make a full circle with spin one half. So what happens to wave function? It gets this additional uh, space vector. It gets minus one. Uh, but in Bosemer field, I have to make sure that the wave function is single valued. And that will bring me immediately additional pi into the quantization condition. So this is just the conventional um, phase that comes from, uh, what is it called? Um, uh, De Broglie length, wavelength, uh, multiplied by two pi r or whatever. Uh, but this additional pi is, uh, is different. It just comes from the, uh, from the uh, fact that there is a periodic function and uh, it, does, uh, it does have structure. Uh, so, uh, there are two ways to look at this additional term. Uh, the one way is that uh, just by, by symmetry here, the spin is confined to the plane, okay? And when the spin makes a full circle, uh, then um, the, the solid angle that is supported by the circle is, uh, is two pi. Uh, so, but, but that immediately actually uh, gives a relation to Berry phase, right? And uh, what we understand that actually uh, what it should be taken into account probably <laughs> is that in the quantization, one needs to account for Berry connection, uh, which uh, contains the derivative of the self periodic function. So this term basically uh, does contribute pi uh, to, the, uh, to the quantization condition. Uh, actually, um, uh, maybe uh, as, an ex as a side, if, if I take into account Zeeman interaction with the field, then uh, I will, I will uh, tilt the spin out of the plane. And uh, the solid angle will be different from two pi, uh, and it gives you two things. One is that uh, the, the Berry phase will change, right? Because uh, as we know, uh, the, 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 angle, the solid angle just determines the Berry phase, All right? So, so Berry phase is not secret. It, can, it doesn't have to be uh, discrete. It can be anything. By the same token, when I, when I tilt the spin, I'll open a, a gap in the direct point, at the direct point, uh, which uh, uh, actually this spectrum uh, does have. Um, so uh, basically, this example expires. Uh, in, uh, 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 this, this example um, 
gave us an inspiration to uh, look at the problem at full, uh, at full uh, generality, and that's uh, what Iris is uh, immensely strong uh, in. And basically, what we considered uh, is electron spectrum with uh, with arbitrary number of degenerate bands, uh, and uh, on top of that, each band may uh, create uh, a number of trajectories uh, when you cut it with uh, PZ equals uh, something constant, uh, 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 which are related by some elements of uh, uh, spatial symmetry. So total degeneracy here then is D cross L uh, for the trajectories that uh, are relevant for the, uh, uh, for the Landau quantization. And <laughs> what we did, uh, we generalized the semi-classical quantization condition that becomes uh, a Fibisha metric condition uh, that determines uh, a number of eigenvalues uh, lambda A of some unitary uh, matrix. Uh, and uh, uh, this uh, unitary matrix basically uh, gives you phases. <coughs> uh, and those can be found uh, in terms uh, of the original Hamiltonian. Uh, and, and the theory that uh, we developed is, is gauge invariant in the sense that uh, it doesn't matter uh, we, we can, we can uh, endow uh, the basis function with, uh, with arbitrary phase, uh, and um, uh, the theory uh, will not depend uh, on, the, uh, on these phases. Uh, so uh, lastly, uh, 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 we establish symmetry constraints uh, on these phases, and it uh, turns out that combination of uh, special symmetries and time reversal gives uh, uh, just 10 uh, symmetry classes of, of the Fermi or of the uh, extremal orbits. Uh, so, uh, just for the terminology's sake, uh, there is this D and L, and I'll give an example uh, of uh, of what is D and what is L. So, if you have uh, two DEG without spin orbit coupling, trivial case. Uh, in our language, uh, D equals two because there are two bands: one for, one for spin up, another for spin down, and in each band there is one orbit. So L equals one. So in this case, uh, there is pretty trivial consideration for any experimentalist, but <laughs> kind of uh, jumped on us. That basically, uh, we cannot tell what are the angular phase shifts uh, for each direction of the spin because the, the effective mass uh, may be different from the free mass, and this enters into the G factor, and this one enters into the Landau uh, quantization condition. So these lambdas individually are something, but sum of lambdas is zero. So that's a trivial example of, of a symmetry constraint uh, because of time reversal. Uh, now, uh, uh, with uh, Rosbach, uh, D equals one uh, and L equals one. So, uh, because now, uh, depending uh, on the direction, on the correlative of the state, whether momentum and, uh, and spin form a positive or negative angle, uh, the energies are different or rather at, at one energy there are two different surfaces, uh, then it means that basically for uh, each of the bands uh, there is just one trajectory. So D equals one, L equals one. In this case, uh, we can guarantee that, uh, that the phase equals pi, and that was just uh, on the previous slide. Uh, and then there are more complicated examples and, and more interesting uh, when uh, uh, this phases lambda uh, additionally encode uh, geometric phase, which is non-abelian, uh, and uh, possibly uh, orbital monetization. Uh, now, uh, an example for the non-abelian phase uh, is uh, in deformed graphene. So, in, in graphene, you have two uh, uh, Dirac points, uh, which will form in our language d equals uh, d equals two l equals two, but now. Uh, you can deform it, and then um, you basically you have a pseudo spin that uh, encodes the state uh, that is a combination of uh, of these two sublattices A and B, uh, and um, uh, that uh, actually this deformation may uh, lift uh, the uh, di may open a gap in direct points, uh, and the question is then what happens to the uh, uh, to the uh, uh, the uh, quantized spectrum, what happens to the Anzager phases. So at a technical level, what is done is that basically we separate uh, the, uh, this, uh, this space uh, of, of states 
on the low energies of space uh, and all other bands. So uh, this, these are D bands uh, that are uh, uh, that contain uh, the Fermi uh, uh, surface, uh, and uh, uh, and Q is the rest. And to the leading order uh, in uh, magnetic field, uh, dynamics is given by parallel substitution. So uh, this H zero is literally the parallel Hamiltonian. And then what Iris uh, did uh, uh, is to find uh, systematically corrections uh, in magnetic field uh, to the parallel Hamiltonian. And uh, in the uh, uh, lowest non-vanishing uh, order, uh, you have transitions between the lower energies of space and higher, uh, and higher bands. And they bring about uh, several terms to the Hamiltonian. Uh, uh, so this correction is H1. And these three terms are, um, the first one is, is, is Barry. Uh, and this is a term where uh, the gradient acts on the uh, cell periodic function. Uh, there is another term that uh, corresponds to orbital moment. And I'll tell you in a minute what is that. And finally, there is a term which is almost trivial. It's a Zeeman term. Uh, and actually, this is within the band, but it accounts for the uh, Zeeman interaction. Pardon? Yes. Yeah, yeah, it, it, yeah. Yes, it, it connects. Uh, yeah, different orbits. Yeah. Yep, yep, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, right. So, uh, so the first term uh, creates, uh, well, generates the Berry phase. Uh, so that basically, I think this is the answer, probably partial answer to your question. Uh, so just Berry connection integrated over the orbit. Uh, now this second term, orbital moment, uh, uh, the uh, orbital term uh, is B uh, cross what, um, uh, what I think we correctly call orbital moment. And this is the uh, R cross P, but of diagonal res with respect to separation of the space on uh, low and high energy. So basically, it's a virtual transition uh, to higher band and back, uh, controlled by uh, the off-diagonal terms of the coordinate and momentum operators. So here is uh, this term written in more detail. Uh, so, so if you look at this term uh, in the context of, uh, uh, of the Landau quantization, actually, this term was looked up by Chan Nu uh, uh, for describing semi-classical motion of a wave packet, which I will not talk about this, but it actually allows to give some interpretation of orbital term in the in terms of rotation of the uh, wave packet around uh, some axis, around itself. So this is basically, uh, semi-classically tells about some internal spin of a state. Uh, on a simpler language, basically, if you form a band out of states that have some angular momentum, you, you, you get some orbital moment. And that's uh, what happens here. Uh, this kind of terms without actually uh, this uh, uh, language was were introduced by in, in a paper by Roth, uh, R-O-T-H, uh, also uh, in the late 50s. Uh, so now, uh, how we proceed further. So uh, one basically writes an evolution. One looks at the evolution of the, of the state when you go around the uh, closed orbit. Uh, and uh, it acquires uh, a, a factor. Uh, which, uh, as far as I understand, is called Wilson loop. Uh, and um, uh, this, this factor contains a large part, uh, which basically uh, corresponds to the area uh, swept uh, by this trajectory. And this is uh, this k uh, uh, x uh, dot k y, uh, well, kx dky, uh, uh, creates the conventional condition condition. And this correction uh, basically yields the, uh, uh, the unitary operator that uh, has uh, our eigenvalues lambda. So basically, that's how uh, these um, uh, lambdas are defined. Uh, and now, uh, for the symmetry, uh, what one has to do is basically to analyze uh, the, uh, the operator uh, that enters into the Wilson loop. Uh, and here again are the definitions. So this is the very connection. This is the uh, element of uh, orbital uh, magnetization. And one has to apply all elements of symmetry uh, point group symmetry and time, uh, time reversal uh, uh, to these terms. Uh, 
And it turns out that there are only 10 uh, symmetry classes. So <coughs> why 10? Uh, it is pretty, pretty simple. Uh, <coughs> so uh, for any symmetry element uh, G, there are um, uh, three types of mappings uh, in 2D space, in 2D momentum space. And 2D because we, we cut uh, the Fermi surface by some plane uh, perpendicular to the field. So uh, we uh, may uh, map K onto K by transformation. So that excludes basically any non-trivial uh, spatial transformation. And there are just two possibilities uh, which uh, correspond to having or having no time reversal. Now, uh, class two corresponds to non-trivial spatial transformation uh, that maps K onto some point on the orbit. Uh, and then um, it may be on the same orbit or on a distinct orbit, uh, if there are more than one orbit for given D. So each of them gives uh, four options because uh, there are two uh, possibilities for, uh, for the spatial mapping uh, reflection or irritation preserving and two options with respect to time reversal. So uh, two times two is four. Uh, and uh, on the same orbit on different or different orbits, it's, uh, it's four and four. So two plus four plus four is 10, that's it. So I don't know if there is a there is more sophisticated view of it, but uh, for, 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 for now it looks like just enumeration of all possibilities. And uh, so some of the parts of this table, table definitely beyond uh, me. So basically what Iris developed is, uh, uh, is full algebraic construction that corresponds to uh, uh, these uh, transformations. Uh, and what uh, we will be concentrating on in the you know, next one, minus one or minus two minutes, uh, is uh, uh, the symmetry and the consequence for, the, uh, for lambdas. And basically, as you see, uh, there, uh, in most cases, there are conditions for sums of lambdas, which are zeros or pi's, but not of, on individual lambdas. Uh, and uh, in some cases, there is additional way to say whether, whether it's zero or pi, which is beyond. Yeah, by the way, so, so uh, these are all concrete. Uh, so lots of these things are very concrete. So graphene, deformed graphene, uh, tungsten telluride, uh, sodium, uh, bismutide, <coughs> and, and so on. Uh, and um, one, may one may actually figure out whether it's zero or pi, uh, looking at some considerations beyond symmetry, uh, uh, request, uh, asking a question whether uh, a trajectory is contractible if you move it towards uh, the bottom of the bend and it may be contractible and then it's zero or it may hit a singularity in which case it's pi. Uh, <clears throat> so basically direct points are belong to this consider to this case and uh, some Lipschitz transition things belong to this one. Uh, now uh, uh, basically last uh, 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 kind of conceptual question I wanted to address uh, is that how you go from one symmetry to another. So here's an example. So here uh, uh, there is some symmetry that relates um, that relates uh, trajectory to itself, and here to be are two different well are several trajectories, and symmetry relates trajectories between themselves. Okay. So, uh, but on the other hand, I may imagine a spectrum like that, and if I just change Fermi level. Uh, from above the settled point to below the settled point, I do change the symmetry, okay? And it's physics, it's not mathematics, I can do it continuously, and the question is how I go from one plus to another, right? So I, how I go from this to this? Uh, what happens to observables? And actually, uh, this is another cute part of story, it's, it's matrix uh, breakdown. So basically, when we are close to the settled point, we go from uh, single connected trajectories to double connected. And uh, if the distance is small in momentum space, then a particle can jump from one trajectory to another, or here it can jump from one section to another section. And that actually uh, has certain results, certain consequences for the quantization condition that actually can be written in a very uh, cute form uh, uh, in terms of the phases uh, accumulated uh, for each of the trajectories. And uh, I have to admit that apart from this geometrical and, and Berry phase, it was understood by us in 61. And it, in some, somewhere deep in one of his papers, you can find this condition written in some pretty horrible way. But, but basically, it, it is this one. And the only addition is that we understood that also Berry phase inter, uh, uh, is uh, con contained in the phases. And then one may actually see the difference between the trivial and non-trivial uh, 
cases and uh, I'll just give a simple, simplest example. In this case, uh, uh, there are very phases for each of the trajectories, say pi, pi and minus pi, and if you go down, basically they cancel each other, the, the, the very uh, terms cancel each other, and for this trajectory, there is a trivial phase zero. Now, uh, one may also look uh, at, uh, really, almost at the end, uh, one may look also at, uh, uh, at the uh, interesting question about uh, uh, metric breakdown for, uh, for the over-tilted uh, uh, cone uh, for while two materials. And in that case, again, without any uh, details, what happens is the barrier phase jumps from one trajectory to another. So the barrier phases uh, basically trade places between two trajectories. And uh, in general, these trajectories have different areas. So there are two sequences of Landau levels and uh, the Azegger phase shift uh, jumps from one series to another series when you cross uh, the uh, Dirac point. Uh, and we apply to this to various things. The only one remark I want to make is that uh, um, it's, it, we realize that one should be very careful when uh, declaring a metal to be non-trivial based on uh, observation of very phase pi. And the reason is that uh, actually when one measures uh, 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 the uh, and uh, uses Lipschitz-Kasevich formula, there is this sum of our trajectories uh, that enters. And the thing is, if you, if you add two cosines with opposite phases, you know, if you, can, you can combine them into one cosine. And, and uh, some non-discrete uh, phases will not show up. They will show up as some uh, amplitude in front. So, so basically, the thing is that one, one, has, one should not stop at measuring the, uh, the main harmonic of, uh, of uh, the uh, uh, the gas one installations, and uh, which, which people do now. And it turned out that actually people di didn't do it before. So this is, uh, an, an, I would say, an ancient paper of Schoenberg who actually did measurements in bismuth up to, I don't remember, was it fifth, I think, harmonic, to see uh, spin splitting uh, of levels uh, in, uh, in bismuth. So, uh, and this is some examples. So I'll stop with that, just telling that uh, basically, if I look again at uh, modified Anzager relation, there is this main term uh, which gave rise to phenomenology, and this is this, I would say, new term uh, that uh, I hope uh, gives rise to stop of that I was talking about. Thank you.